We're in Louisiana, a week into production, and we get a warning from production that a tornado's coming through. So within maybe 15 minutes, 10 minutes trying to wrap, we just got annihilated. Just downpour and thunder and lightning. We were kind of out a bunch of lights, but lo and behold, we're like in the morning, aperture is all working. They held up when traditional HMIs in these conditions didn't, and they were able to help us dramatically on this feature because of that. Hi, my name's Chris Stacy, and I'm the cinematographer on The Blind. Like a lot of kids, I used to steal my dad's camera and we used to go film skateboarding and snowboarding um, in Toronto, where I grew up. From that point, I got into music. I started shooting music videos for the band. My agent at the time, he's like, oh, you're pretty good at that. And I'm like, oh. And so, you know, I started directing Royce the Five Nine and CeeLo and a lot of these big Canadian artists I was able to work with at such a young age. And then from there, it went into commercials, documentaries and TV series, and then, you know, here we are doing some features. The Blind's the story of Phil Robertson. He's the patriarch of Duck Dynasty. So it's the life of Phil growing up from the 1950s to 1975, where he invented his first duck call, which kind of changed their lives and changed his lives. And it's the story of alcohol and abuse and, you know, his story of redemption. I think there's two things we looked at when we wanted to figure out how we wanted to visually adapt Phil's story. The first thing was is understanding that it was a period piece, right? Developing a look and a style that was gonna feel like it was from that period. The other thing is when you're dealing with drama and something that is real and something that really happened, I think the style of cinematography you wanna do is just be a fly on the wall. And if it meant being knee deep in mud, that's what we did. When we first walk into a room, into a scene, I love just seeing what the practical lights are doing. I mean, that's the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna turn on the lights. I'm gonna see where the sun's coming in. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. If we're on a set and the sun's coming through the window and hitting something a certain way, I'm like, oh, how can I just recreate that? I remember one of the cool tricky things that we were able to do with the 1200D is that we were able to throw that thing out on a boat with a little putt-putt generator and go put a light source like 100 feet back in a swamp at night. Being able to be out on the water uh, with 1200Ds and just run those off batteries or run those off of, you know, little putt-putts was, was crucial. You got to die and then you need to be born again. All right, so now we're gonna look at some lighting breakdowns for scenes in the blind. So this scene, this is Phil and Kay's first date that they had after school. Uh, they're going to a place called uh, Fertitas. This is night exterior. Um, so we had uh, a mixture of practicals, uh, which were the sodium vapors, which were here. We worked with the city to be able to turn off certain fixtures. So you can see like these ones here in the back. We didn't want a lot of light. And so we would X those out and X those out. The art department did an amazing job. The uh, fluorescent sign wasn't working, hadn't been working for 20 years of this building. And so we did a full restoration for them on the neon sign. And that motivated a lot of the lights we had underneath here and here and here. There were RGB fixtures underneath the awnings, which did that, but our main source was coming from a condor. It was interesting because originally there was an 18K up there. My gaffer wanted to put it up and I was like, it's gonna be too bright, I don't need it. The problem was is that we still had to deal with the wides and the practicals of sodium vapor lights. And so my gut told me to go and put up the Novas and that they would be enough. We threw them all up there, rigged them all up there, and that's providing all the fill that's coming this way. And I believe actually in this phone booth right here, we actually put some MCs in the roof because it wasn't a working phone booth. All we really did is we brought in a china silk or something like that, and that was here. And then still on the condor, the Novas were pumping through this way. And so it was just creating a nice little wrap around them. Really, it was just incorporating something a little softer when we went into the close-ups. And definitely, it was probably one of the only times we used like a china silk, something really soft and wrappy. And mainly we did that because this is like, as you can see, the images are super nostalgic and like felt like that like 60s diner. You know what? I changed my mind. Um, could I, you just give me one of those single grilled cheeses? And Rachel, you owe me a fry from last week, so don't go cheating on me again. Okay. This is the bar scene. This is where Phil meets Big Al. 
If there was a villain in the story, he's the most lovable villain in the story. That's Connor Tillman there, the person who encourages him to drink and do a lot of bad things. And so this is Phil's job interview. We decided that it's like, why not be like really on the nose and we're lighting this whole thing red. Luckily in the 70s when this was happening, you know, red was a thing. And so what we ended up doing is we wrapped the exterior lining with tubes. We hung Novas, um, which gave us a red, and we didn't have them too intense. And then outside here in the blue, where the bar sign is, that was another Nova, casting like a nice little blue hue. There wasn't a lot of opportunities in this film for us to really have fun with color. And this just was like, was too good of an opportunity not to. So, I mean, you can see there's not a, another skin tone or color tone. I mean, he's like straight red. And then we used the blue in the background coming through. There it is, that again. That was kind of giving me that separation on the background. Over here, we had some of the B7Cs. So I think we must have had like, I don't know, at least six of them in that bar, kind of going all over the place. But really, it was it was the, the B7 right there that was lighting basically the whole scene here. I think I killed every other fixture in here, except for the little blue that you can see coming in here, just to give them some shape, because when you're dealing with like just one tone, of color it's like creating some kind of contrast in that so in the end uh you know for this angle it was really about taking light away it's honestly one of my favorite scenes in the movie i think the dynamic between uh, aaron and, and connor was is awesome <laughs> so this is the rain tower scene he's kicking out k taking the kids and get the hell out of here we knew it was rain towers from the beginning um, that we wanted to do. They were a little problematic because being in Shreveport, Louisiana, there's not a lot of like real effects houses and things like that. So we actually had to build our towers. I don't even think we had a condor because we didn't need it, but they were on a big scissor lift. We had a bunch of 1200s and they were basically blasting and backlighting this set here. That was the main thing. And then inside the house back here, lighting him up, we had a few tungsten fixtures in the background here and then we needed just a lot of heat on them. Ah, and then, I forgot, I almost forgot. Coming from this way to kind of do this, all this soft kind of lighting on the car and as they're walking out, you don't see it, but we had Nova three, maybe two Novas coming from over here. And I think we were bouncing them into a 12 by, 12 by 12 ultra bounce. And so they were going into there and there was an actually another sodium vapor light right here that we couldn't turn off. And so we did the same thing. We took our color temp reading and we matched the Novas to that. And then we blasted light back through, which gave us our nice soft fill on this side. There's a wider version of it, but you can see this is really beautiful with the rain coming down. And so we didn't have condors that day, but on the roof of the house, we had two 1200s on the roof on low boys and they were backlighting the rain. The rain towers were hitting the 1200 seas like this all night long, and we didn't care because they had a waterproof rating, and I'm like, I'm gonna put that to the test. And lo and behold, they're still working and kicking today. So these are real, 1960s, 50s Airstream trailers. I couldn't even fit my shoulders through some of the doorways in these trailers. So, I mean, it was tiny. So these were practicals. This is a B7C, a B7C, probably this one as well. And so again, we just matched the color temp. We kind of matched the, those uh, by eye. Uh, we had some lighting gags with this one. And so it was really easy just to use the app to turn it on and off when he went in to turn on the light. Because that light fixture, actually, we couldn't run power to it. And so with a battery powered bulb, aperture for the win. And then I think up in here, you can't really see, but those were MCs. There was a kitchen lighting. And so we just plopped a bunch of MCs in there that kind of recreated that. And then above here, we had these skylights. So there was a skylight here and then another one in the back room. And so those were 56 Kelvin and those were the F21s. And so a lot of the time we wanted just this tickle of ambience in there. I like to shoot to my eye. Um, I don't love going, I'm gonna make it really bright and then bring it all down in the grade. So that led us to having to deal with like low light levels and things like that. Once we got into the close-ups of that scene, that would have been probably another F21 on the ceiling, taped onto the ceiling like we talked about, like triple diffused and then just coming down. 
Sometimes simple is better. Um, you don't need to go crazy and be complicated for a scene. Sometimes practically, you know, the practical sometimes are all you need or sometimes you need just a little bit of light to make something look good. I think the piece of advice I'd give to any young cinematographer or filmmaker is go have fun. I mean, you have SLRs where you can, you know, do whatever you want and have a good image. Like, just go shoot. No matter what it is, be behind the camera, be operating, be shooting, watch movies, love movies, understand what they're doing, how they're doing, pause it. Be a student of film and study it and figure out how those guys did it and figure out how you can emulate that. Don't come in here thinking it's gonna be a paycheck or whatever, I mean, love what you do. You're gonna spend hours lighting, you're gonna be miserable, but we love what we do. And so, yeah, if, if you don't love it, it's probably not the right thing for you.